and welcome to Chain Reaction. I'm Ronnie Ancona. Now, my guest this evening is one of the finest comics of today. He's immensely versatile. He not only writes and tells his own jokes, but he also laughs at them as well. <laughs> the star of Not Going Out, fortunately, he has come out tonight, but not in a sexual way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lee Mack. <laughs> Well, this is all very Radio 4, isn't it? Well, you mentioned already, when they asked me who I wanted to interview, I said the DJ, Steve Lamack, but it was a very bad line on the phone. How do you think I felt? I thought I was getting Ronnie O'Sullivan. (laughs) That's not true, actually, because Lee and I have known each other for years and years, and uh, um, we do actually share this extraordinary coincidence in that he was born and brought up in exactly the same t- uh, town as my mother was, which is Southport. Correct. Which leads me to my first question, are you my mother? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not your mother, but there's a possibility that I am your father. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, 50-50 at best, but it's a possibility. Uh, when did you first realise you were funny? Well, my first performance, I guess, was um, that I remember was standing on top of the school roof when I was about 11 or 12. And I, I, went, to, I went to a school in Blackburn, so I arrived in Southport with a very strong Lancashire accent, much stronger than this. And in Southport, they're, they're far softer spoken. Yeah. And so they just treated me like I was come, come straight out of the pits. So, so I thought you... I'd play on that, so I ended up getting on top of the school roof and doing impressions of Bobby Ball. <laughs> And now, let me tell you, and I know you're a bit of adept at the old impressions yourself, my Bobby Ball was fantastic. I just remember them turning up and going, Oi, Lee, do that funny voice you do. And I was going, that's my voice. And they're going, well, just do it for us. And I thought, I can't just keep talking, so I'll actually put it into an act. So I stood on the roof and said, rock on, Tommy. <laughs> Got a smattering of applause, not bad. You were funny at school. Well, I was definitely... If you look at my school reports, they go... First year, I was really, like, um, the swatty kid. You know, you used to get A and... A was your, your attainment yeah, yeah, yeah. and one was your effort. Yeah. So I was all A1s for the first year. Yeah. And then my, my effort went down to like A2, but my attainment stayed up. So I got a bit cocky, thinking I'd have to try as hard as the others. Then it went to about A3, but I was thinking I'm still A's. Anyway, cut to five years later, I'm like, F19. <laughs> I've got a school report at home that says, sooner or later, Lee will realise that joking around in class will get him nowhere. And he was right, wasn't he? Well, the thing is, the thing yeah. is it, it's obviously I, something I've said in, in interviews which, make, which suggests, you know, how I showed him. But actually, the boring answer is actually he's right because it's quite hard to write comedy. Yeah, so yeah. you have to be quite... You have to write all day. It's quite academic. In I, I have to say, I met, uh, I met Lee when we first worked on the... Uh, on a show called the, the Sketch Show that I don't think is that well remembered anymore. Well, the clue is it, when you have to start with the phrase "a show called." That's a usually show. a sign that people <laughs> are going to know what the next name. But it won a BAFTA. It and, did. And, it was and, so and, exciting, uh, that wasn't it? Wasn't it great? When it we won was a BAFTA? very, very exciting. And Lee was an extremely prolific writer on it. So that show that didn't last that long and that you can't remember that was cancelled. I wrote that. <laughs> yeah. Whereas and Ronnie frankly, didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> I was really excited about it. This is my first telly job, that proper telly job, I think. Did you use a lot of your past experience as inspiration for some of the sketches? Because there was a sketch about the jockey, the jockey and yeah. there was a sketch about the bingo hall. And then, of course, you did work as a stable boy, didn't you? Yes, in a bingo hall. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you went wrong. That's, that's, yeah. It was far worse working in the stables as a bingo caller. That was a lot. <laughs> And you and that because you looked after Red Rum. I did, yeah. Well, I was. I was is that where Red Rum is now? Running a a, a bingo, a bingo hall. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere the hooves must really get <laughs> in the way. It's not easy picking up the ping pong balls. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. I was I was a stable boy at sixteen. I decided I basically got thrown out of college for messing about. But did you decided at this point that you wanted to pursue comedy? Or was it just? Oh something no, no. I, that I knew just... when I was about fourteen. I thought I'll be a comedian. That, you did. Think I remember that. thinking that, that in was my an head. Epiphany. It was for definitely you. in my head. I said I will be a comedian, but I had absolutely no idea what that meant or how you did it so in my head I probably also said at the same time I'm going to be an astronaut and I'm going to you know be a famous actor yes so all these things you say these things but you don't really think they're going to happen so I thought well I better find some other way to become uh, get on telly so I thought I know I'll be a jockey because I was watching I was watching the horse racing 
doesn't... You're laughing like you haven't all thought at some point, well, I'll be a jockey to get on telly. We've all thought it, haven't we? So I, uh, I was literally watching... I got thrown out of college. I remember sitting at home thinking, what am I going to do with my, the rest of my life? I've just been thrown out of college. And horse racing was on. And I thought, I'm really into sport, but I've not been very good at them. I reckon that's the one sport where you don't have to be as good as someone else, i.e. the horse. Right? <laughs> but as long as I can sit still for about half an hour, or however long these races take, <laughs> <laughs> then I should be all right. So I, so I literally rang up my local stables, which by coincidence was the home of Red Rum, and I said, um, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to work in the yard. And he said... Uh, <laughs> <I'd>, uh, <laughs> I didn't think it would have gone directly through to him as well. But... So, <laughs> it's, can we make any correlation between the dates you worked with Red Rum and then his uh, subsequent the disappearance? <laughs> You're making the schoolboy error of mixing up red rum with Shergar, but we'll carry it on anyway. Oh, of course That's I okay. am. That's OK, we can go with it anyway. If it makes it more of an interesting anecdote, I am happy to say on the radio that I kidnapped <laughs> Red Rum and held him for ransom for many years. Oh, dear. I said, pay the ransom, I've got win a lot on the other line. <laughs> Actually, win a lot would have been an appropriate name for the uh, dog food Red Rum, cos he did win the Grand National three times. He it? did! <laughs> Did you have any comedic heroes or did you actively pursue, watch, love comedy as a yeah, kid? Yeah, I suppose when I was, as I said, I was probably about 15 when I really wanted to, when I got into comedy. This is, this is what I want to see was alternative comedy and, and the uh, Friday night live shows with Ben Elton and uh, the young ones, you know, all those shows are the things that made me go, this is what, you know, because up until then I'd only seen that other world of comedy and, and it was very London-centric, so we only saw it on the telly up north. There was no clubs up north. I mean, you uh, have always been very sort of upfront about your love of Horses. Eric Morecambe. Oh. Uh, yes, oh, absolutely, yeah. I'm upfront about it. <laughs> Make it sound like being into Eric Morecambe's like being addicted to heroin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it started off, I was a very um, lonely child and I was... <laughs> I was getting my fixes from Sid Little and yeah. Eddie Lard. <laughs> I knew so when I was you... heavily into Russ Abbott that things were very serious. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Um, no, but you, you did love Eric Morgan, didn't I you? I did, yeah. I was... Les Dawson? But I, and Les Dawson as well. Les Dawson was one of the first... Comedians. My mum won tickets um, to see Les Dawson when I was a kid. And first prize was like a blender. And second prize <laughs> yes. was going to see Les Dawson live. So I was... See, what the blender was in front of Les Dawson? <laughs> he wasn't supporting Les No, Dawson. I didn't. <laughs> But I do remember thinking, as I was watching on stage, thinking, however great he is, if you were to stick ice and orange juice in his mouth, it wouldn't come out as a smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> Would was... you say he was an influence? Would you say that... Who would you say was an, an, influence. an influence? Or was it all a bit of a... Well, I started really like, getting into comedy, as in watching it in, sort of obsessively at about the age of sort of 20. And that's when I started sort of watching more and more and Wise. I wasn't one of these kids that grew oh, up watching really? more and Wise. I watched it, but I, wasn't, I don't remember being obsessed by more and Wise. I read somewhere that you had a bit of a moment when you went to the comedy store and yeah. you saw two live comics, very famous comics, Eddie Izzard and Steve Coogan. Yeah, I, I, it was 1990, so at this age I'm now at 22, and I come to London and I've only ever seen comedy on TV. I've never seen live comedy or live comedy that I sort of wanted to watch because mm. I used to be a blue coat at Pontins before that. That's and the comedians weren't my sort of thing, to be honest with you. And, and so when I came to the comedy store, I suddenly thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. And on the bill was Eddie Izzard comparing and Steve Coogan was headlining. But at the time, I didn't know who either of them were, you know. No. Just, I just remember them saying, please welcome from Spitting Image. And I thought... Because Steve Coogan used to do the Spitting Image voices. Yes. I thought I was in... Sh I couldn't... I felt like I was... I felt like I was in London. <laughs> yes. I really did. I remember thinking, this is great. So I tried stand-up. Where did you... Where was your first gig? It was a place called the Bun Shop in Surbiton. It was called the Gong Show, and what that would... Well, the Gong Show is a, a comedy yeah. store idea, isn't it, where yeah. the new acts from the audience will get up and you get gonged off stage. Well, this small club had, I think, nicked the idea, and a man dressed as a gimp would hold a, a gong <laughs> and, uh, oh, my God, it's a dream. This isn't the first gig. <laughs> my first act, I decided I didn't have the confidence to do stand-up, so what I'd do is I would tell old jokes get a load of old jokes together that I'd heard in the pubs and stuff and just tell them. But I thought, you can't do that, I have to act it out. So one of them was about a joke about fish. And uh, I, I actually bought the fish from the fishmonger so I, <laughs> so I could act it out. So I'd say, 
And then along came the crab. I get the crab out. Uh, uh. You'd get the crab. Get the, the crab, crab out. And then the cod. The problem is I got gonged off before I got to the suitcase full of fish. <laughs> because I was a student, I had to keep the fish for the next gig and it started to get a bit smelly. <laughs> and I used to go home and freeze the fish so it wouldn't smell, but then defrost it because it wouldn't have worked. As we all know, there's nothing funny about frozen fish. <laughs> to be floppy, obviously, so I defrost it. And then after about two months, and I, I, I started getting to the joke. I wasn't gong before it. And it became a staple part of my act, but not my diet, funny enough, because <laughs> they stunk. What was the worst... What, did you oh, remember... Oh, the crab. Did... He was terrible with his lines. <laughs> <laughs> what was He'd always walk worst... off sideways like he was embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Was it, do you remember your worst gig? Because I remember yes. when I first started stand up and what I was, your was worst so gig? Ter- Tell me your worst gig. My worst gig was so bad that normally if you die a terrible death, the promoter of the club is really quite annoyed with you because you've kind of mucked up their evening. But my death was so bad, I ran out of the club and I just ran onto a bus that was passing. I didn't even know where it was going. <laughs> I, that, I seriously kidding. I was so appallingly humiliated that all the comics on the bill had phoned me up to check I was still alive. <laughs> even comics who didn't know me. The promoter and the, and the club owner rang me up just to see if I where was still the sort of thing. I, I think it was... Brutal. Wouldn't that be great like if you'd have gone absolute... on like a two-hour journey and didn't stop? And when you got off... There was like 20 really desolate looking comedians just. <laughs> oh. Oh. You've just done the uh, dog and partridge, I mean. <laughs> just, just... <laughs> You got into television relatively quickly, didn't you, really? I mean, well, you got discovered quite relative, quickly. Relative, yeah. To, to, well, relative, in the mid 90s, relatively quickly. Now it would be considered. Normal. Old time, old time. Old timer. Sure? When I was a kid, there was only two sure. channels. Let me tell you. Yeah, it's all changed. Yeah. Oh, it, really it was different. Has we got changed. paid in badges. It was all different. <laughs> the uh, yes, I, I got. Well, I did television far too early. I, I I probably did it after two years of doing stand up. I was hosting a Channel Four show called Gas. Yeah. And I think uh, I think we all remember Gas, don't we, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> For those that can't see at home, I'm looking around, hopefully, the audience, to see if anyone raised a hand. But uh, Gas was a stand-up show of the mid-90s for new comedians. And that was pe- a big break. It was, a lot of comics did well out, but Peter Kay was on it. And, uh, uh, what uh, happened to him? Well, exactly, he exploded, didn't he? I don't mean literally, he just got very big. I mean, he... Uh, <laughs> he um, but, yeah, so uh, I was on Gas, but I was on after two years, and I wasn't ready for that. I really wasn't. Mm. And, and, and it was quite... So I sort of did that for a couple of series and then sort of disappeared off the TV radar for a few years. But my, my, my abiding memory of the show was having the pleasure of every time I introduced the producer, I could say, hello, this is Sandy, she's the producer of Gas. <laughs> <laughs> Which was always my favourite part of the day, to be honest with you. But then you, you did something very different. You had a whole series of highly successful Edinburgh shows um, a sketch troupe. There were three of you. Yes. And there was you, Catherine Tate, and, and uh, Dan. Dan Antoposki, yes. And uh, Catherine was in the sketch show. She was my little sidekick at the time. She was, she was nothing. I found her. I found her <laughs> orphanaged, <laughs> orphanaged under Waterloo Bridge, and I picked her up. <laughs> she, she used to do this old woman in her stand-up routine. That the old woman that she then developed into the character. But she used to How long did you do that for? Because it did very well, didn't it, that show? Yeah, well, we did it for a couple of years. It was your Edinburgh. show, didn't you? You wrote it. Well, it? it was my show. It was called Lee Max Bits. And then I would have a little joke with her and say that she said, I want my name in the title. And I said, Why don't we call it Lee Max Bitch? And she didn't like that. <laughs> and they're funny like that, women. They don't like that, that at all. That was during your particularly politically correct stage. That's right, wasn't yeah, it? yeah. They, yeah. Uh, and, then, and then how did you get involved? And then, of course, this is where you fit into my, my life, Ronnie Ancona. Because... Me, darling. Yes, you. It's the time for my appearance. Yes, it's all about you now, Ron. <laughs> I. Uh... <laughs> Because, oh, because we, we, we did a show for ITV called The Sketch Show, and you were the famous one at the time. We were nobodies, but you'd been on telly already. We looked at you like you show us the way. If only I knew <laughs> then what I knew now. Yeah, and, uh, and it was very, very enjoyable, wasn't it? Someone's actually throwing money. like they, uh, <laughs> They're listening to how our careers are going and thinking... <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's... Going well, does it? Really? He sings He's mentioned two telly still... shows, and yeah, I've not heard of either of them. <laughs> <laughs> Have a cup of tea think... on me. Um... And then, just after that, I got the job in the deli at Morrison's. <laughs> <laughs> I've been very happy, and thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> what 
what struck me was even though you were quite a rookie to TV, you yeah. knew your own mind and you were really incredibly proficient and uh, very hard working. And well, I was always the, terrified the... that we were going to lose the job. I thought if we got on ITV, such a big deal, we've got to keep this and we'll be doing it for 20 years. That's how naive I was. Yeah, I remember that's pretty remember naive. I got everyone together. I said, come on, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. all come to my house and we'll write comedy all day. But, but what was very interesting there is that you do have a real aptitude for... You wrote sketches that were extremely funny, but they weren't. Um, they, they were. They were. They were very funny. Was this leading, Ronnie? <laughs> I think to Red Rom. All oh, right. Um, no, but you weren't contriving to be cutting edge all the time. You were doing things that were. They were funny, but they weren't smutty, and it wasn't rude. But then I don't think you were making it wasn't a political, specific. Was it? It, wasn't... it wasn't political, and I just thought they were. I thought how refreshing for someone to be just funny and it's just funny for the sake of it and it's not trying to be different it's not trying to be culty it's not trying to break any well the word um, the word that you're probably trying to avoid using is mainstream because that's a word that a lot of comedians yeah don't. but i i abhor the no, way no, that you, you, uh, mainstream but you also is... have that sort of because you've, you've the bbc one impression show so you've had that world of you've had both worlds in a way haven't you yes but if on on the world we're involved in because uh, despite the fact that alternative comedy is a phrase that doesn't really exist anymore it's still all born out of the Oxbridge Mafia. Yes, there's still, it is. There's still a presence of, of, if you're not a certain type, you must be the other type, so therefore not as worthy. For me, it's become like, um, it's become like any art form where people think that, you know, if, if, if there's a... You feel a lot more confident saying, I love this band. If that band is not very well known, you're, you're a lot safer, aren't you? If you say, yes. I, I love the, Absolutely. Uh, the Tickle Absolutely. Turkeys, for example, I don't know if they exist. If, if you're listening, I'm sure I you're a great I love the band. Tickle Turkeys. Well, that was the most cut... See, I'm so mainstream, that's the most cutting-edge name I could think of, the Tickle Turkeys. <laughs> I actually am the living embodiment of a chuckle brother, aren't I? <laughs> but, <laughs> let, let's say you were into the Tickle Turkeys, and you say, oh, do you know what band I really like? The Tickle Turkeys, right? No, I'll give you an example. I'll give you another. The Tickle Turkeys an an analogy is going nowhere. I'm, yes, I'm not, I like it. I'm not going to lie. I am bailing out of the Tickle Turkey anecdote, but I will bail back in with Coldplay. When Coldplay first came out, people were quite proud to say they like Coldplay. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. would not be proud to say that now no, because no, they've no. become too mainstream. Yeah. You, you, you feel like you're on dodgy ground saying And it. because comedy is very much... It's very zeitgeisty, and it's also... If you're not trendy yeah. or if you're not cool, then... You get slotted absolutely, into and in a way that was the. I mean, another... yeah, and, and with the sketch show that we did in the, in the early whatever two thousand or whenever it was, it we was definitely old-fashioned. weren't cool. And so if you if you were going for laughs and you heard laughs, it was automatically assumed that that was old school. Not going out. What my sitcom? Your highly su- <laughs> highly successful BBC One sitcom. I'd forgotten all about that. Yes, <laughs> I. <laughs> Let's yes. talk about not going out. I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> Because that is a real um, unashamed gags this way, but in, but it works brilliantly. Yeah, well, we we've done we're doing the fourth series now, and, and it's been a bit of a, a long haul show because it takes a lot of hoops to jump yeah. through to get a, to get a sitcom. The thing is, when we started out, we did we we did the pilot, and we were quite proud of it. But there's no getting around it; it was traditional. It had a studio yeah. audience, and it was exactly the same. In fact, the day before we filmed the pilot. There was a documentary on ITV. This was the day before. I'm sitting there, a nervous wreck, thinking, I hope it goes well, this. I'll watch telly, that'll relax me. (laughs) ITV had a show called The Sitcom Is Dead. (laughs) The the then head of ITV hosted this show where he interviewed people like Victoria Wood, who'd done things like Dinner Ladies and stuff, who basically proclaimed on television that studio-based sitcom was finished. Because the royal family was big... The office was about mm. to either about to do well or had done well. It was that new well. uh, it was, era of it was a real era. naturalism, wasn't gritty it? Yeah, gritty realism had suddenly come in, and this was not the time for a man to walk in dressed as a chicken, <laughs> and, and and which is exactly what we were doing on the pilot, and and it, it felt very. Um, There's always space for a man dressed as a chicken in my books. <laughs> not in your book. <laughs> you should have said in your book book. <laughs> <laughs> or, or bedroom. I was nearly and, in uh, not going out. He's still, you know. God, she's going to start off again. <laughs> Ro- Ronnie came very close to being in the sitcom, not going to. You tell the story, go on. No, I'm not going to. I- I've obliterated it from my memory. 
There was a. There was, it came down to two people. I've known Ronnie for years, and we want. I wanted. He went for a very skinny blonde American instead. Isn't that just the women that disagreed? That sort of... <laughs> the blokes were going, "Yeah, what's your problem?" <laughs> you never returned my letters for big impression, though, did you? Oh, what, Bobby when I said, Ball? When I said, dear Ronnie, I've now, I, do, I can now do is... Frank Spencer as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I even did the, elef the elephant with the white ears thing. I thought that was a good impression. You no, know, where you listen, take your pockets, your white pockets out. Yeah, I know and that. you say, where's the trunk? You know it that's what I mean. It just didn't no. make the car. It just didn't make the car. I thought it was a good impression. It didn't make the car. It was so close, so close. Um, in Not Going Out, you play a kind of a, a single, kind of low status, bit of a loser, bit of a, a guy about town. Please welcome me Although you're Mac. not really even a... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, where, where would you get your inspiration <laughs> for that? Well, actually, I, was, I based it all on when I was uh, about 24. Before I got married and had kids, that's what I was like. I used to... I never had anywhere to live. I was always dossing around people's houses and sleeping on sofas. and So I based it on that, but... I wrote the pilot probably when I was about 30, 31. That seemed all right to be like that. But now I'm 42, I'm starting to think it might be a bit creepy. <laughs> You're a northerner and you live down south. Do you feel that you still retain a lot of that northern identity? Can you answer that? Can you take that faggot out of your mouth before you answer that question? When she says faggot, can I just point out... <laughs> um, Whip it, then. Whip it. Well, I would, but, you know, it still doesn't get out of my mouth. <laughs> no, well, I've definitely lost my accent. I thought I hadn't, but I saw a video of myself 25 years ago, and I thought, God... And when I got up north, obviously, my mates go, what's happened to your accent? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't sound Scottish, do you? Don't get me wrong, you look it. <laughs> why are you laughing at that? What is... Why would that get a laugh? <laughs> That was, a, that, that was those, a compliment. For those who are at home listening, I'm actually a very deep mahogany brown. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't go Thank well with a bright ginger head, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel, Lee, that um, you're, you're the father of a young family? What? Breaking the news like this to me? <laughs> This is all, your life? Yes, yes. Do you uh, recognise this voice? You haven't paid me maintenance yes. for 14 years. <laughs> yes, I am a father. Um, father no, of two. You're, you're a father of two little boys. Yes. And you're married to a very gorgeous lady. She's, she's all right, isn't she? She's, def I'm de she's definitely better above me average, as everyone tells me. You've done well. You've done very well. I mean, definitely, as, as, as genes go, my wife's got more of the better-looking genes than me, without a doubt. And I know what you're all thinking, but you're a good-looking fella. She must be gorgeous. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> uh, do you find it difficultly juggling work? Oh, yes, You're definitely. Very, very we all do, though, don't we? <laughs> Have you, can you do three oranges now? I can do three oranges, yes. I can Good. do four now. You're joking. I never joke about There's, juggling. Do you know what? We'll put juggling back or on the darts, radio. darts, because he's very good at darts. Yes. Can you juggle darts? Of course I can't juggle darts. <laughs> what kind of lunatic is juggling darts? <laughs> Bad well, I just... What I did was... I'm not a very experienced interviewer. I know that you're very, very good at darts. I thought I'd tie in the juggling question but, with the darts... Oh, you thought you'd get it ..to in. be economic. Oh, right. <laughs> well, it's, uh, yeah, that's not a bad link, I suppose. It could have been worse. You could have gone, Lee, you've got two kids, which makes sense, cos you're very good at darts. <laughs> Good shot. You're yeah, a good yeah. shot. Um, do you find it? <laughs> um, do you find it difficult juggling all this? Yes, work I do. With... <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you? I'm not going to do any juggling. <laughs> right, I promise you. I promise uh, you. I won't say it again. I'll let you get the question. I'm not going to say. Please. Do you find? It's difficult coordinating ah, your better. work, your work, Definitely, and your own yes. with having two Definitely. young kids because they're very demanding. Not only that, I've got to think about the juggling. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hardest thing because it's it's endless, you know. <laughs> Do you feel that comedy has changed in the last? 16 years or how long you've been doing it. Do you think it has changed a lot? I, f I feel it has. Yeah, so. it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely... Um, there was a, when I started off comedy, there was... Um, there was a... Th uh, Badil and uh, Newman had, had just done the uh, 
the first sellout stadium at Wembley Arena. And everyone was uh, saying the phrase, comedy's the new rock and roll. Mm. And I remember at the time thinking, I'm not sure that's a good idea because comedy's supposed to take the mickey out of rock and roll rather than be rock and roll, you know. Mm. And, but now it's far more frightening than that. Now it's become the new pop. You know? What are your ambitions? I'd, li- I'd just like to do... I've got, a, I've got a show that's coming up, a pilot for BBC One. It doesn't sound fair. I'm supposed to say so, probably something bigger and bolder, but just, just doing the next little job, really. I just think... No, I'll take my ambition. My ambition is to probably retire by the time I'm about 55. God, I'm do a bag of f- laughs, aren't I? Do, <laughs> do you feel Some of them are looking at me going, do we have to wait till you're 55? <laughs> What a miserable get. <laughs> when did you feel that you'd arrived, Lee? Oh, or oh, five, when oh, the cab oh, dropped yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, have you arrived? And if you haven't, you better get What's hit. What time are you leaving? <laughs> well, I don't think I've arrived. You never go, right, I've cracked the... You're never very protected. Like, I think a lot of actors who become very famous are sort of... Um, to a certain extent, they're, they're sort of protected because they're shielded within this genre of a character and a mm. play. And so, but you're you're vu- you're much more vulnerable as a comic, and you're well, much you are, more. But you're, but you're as funny as your last thing, and you're kind of out there more. It's true, but at the same time, I've I, I think it's sends you a bit loopy, I suppose. I mean, there is so many, so many times you can eat against us past it half past two in the morning at a petrol station. <laughs> Eighteen. That was my record. <laughs> This is nothing to do with stand-up. I'm just letting you know about a new world record I'm trying. <laughs> and so, do you get a real buzz making people laugh? Uh, yeah, no, I still love it, yeah. It's still the best job in the world, yeah, without a doubt. Cool. Don't get me wrong, before work? when I said I want to retire, just be clear about this, I don't want to retire because I don't like comedy. I love comedy. But I want to retire because I just think it would be nice to just not die at 65. <laughs> <laughs> because I think there's a, very, there's a high proportion of young deaths in comedians, statistically. Heart attacks. Yeah. Do you know that thing before when I said I, I was going to sort of build up the atmosphere again? <laughs> I, I, I won't lie, I'm I don't, I don't make a great warm-up, man. I'm thinking we've got, to, we've got to come to a finish, and I'm thinking, how am I going to get... Should so I have a heart attack? Ross would be able to do this <laughs> What a way to finish how the show. How am I going to wrap it up? How, are you gonna, how am I going to interview Ed Edmondson if I'm dead? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lee Mack. 